Hi, everyone. This is Rich Berliner from Digital Locations. I'm here today with Nicholas Lee, who is a research engineer at Stanford University. Even I've heard of Stanford, Nicholas. Um, obviously, a very prestigious university. Uh, and I uh, appreciate, Nicholas, you being with us today. And I wanted to talk about, um, first of all, why don't you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your background, and then we'll get into the research that you're doing at Stanford. Sure. So I was born and raised in Toronto, Canada. I grew up there, did my undergrad there in engineering science, where I got into learning about aerospace and specializing in aerospace. I got really excited at the time because that was around the the time when the, the Columbia disaster happened. And so there was a lot of turmoil in the industry. There was a lot of wondering what would happen to human space flight or to to spaceflight in general at the time. And so my senior design project in undergrad was working on a concept for a robotic Hubble rescue mission. If you recall back then they were talking about, well, we're not gonna send astronauts up to the shuttle because there's no way to rescue them. And eventually they ended up doing the double shuttle approach on the launch pad. Right. So, so that's what really got me into being excited about spacecraft, but also spacecraft failures, mechanisms, through which human spacecraft as well as robotic spacecraft could fail. I came to Stanford, did my graduate studies here and started in space robotics, but moved over to space environment studies. So I did my PhD on meteorite impacts on spacecraft and electrical effects that will come from those. And we'll be talking about that in more detail through the talk. So I'll leave that at that for now. Great. Um, my postdoc was at Caltech. So I ended up in a lab where we were doing origami foldable, deployable structures. So ways to take a large space structure and make it small enough to put into a launch vehicle. So we were talking about how to robotically assemble in space a 100 meter space telescope or how to make a 60 by 60 meter solar array that could be empowered down to the earth. Well, that's, uh, that's really a very interesting uh, crossroads for what we're working on. Um, so digital locations is working on a research project with Florida International University. Um, some of the things I've seen in their lab relate to origami type foldable antennas and things they're do, working on. And so our interest in research is this direct satellite to mobile communications with the antennas being the most important facet yeah. of this on both ends, both the satellite antennas and then the uh, antennas in your phone um, that, that relate to this. So um, we talked when we initially uh, connected, you and I, um, about uh, the fact you were working on asteroid and impact related research, which is, is a fascinating topic because there's so much, not only asteroids, but there's so much space junk out there. Yeah. And um, in addition to that, the, one of the things you mentioned was the plasma trails that come along with these asteroids and, and, and other types of of uh, space debris. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about that, the questions that my team came up with and asked me to relay to you today is about, um, do the, this plasma trail, does this plasma trail have a frequency associated with it? And how does that relate to interference in this situation that could be uh, um, seen in these kinds of situations? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take a step back and sort of go go through it, my usual spiel. But we, we tend to work on the impact or, or the movement of objects in space in general. So in, we can break these into anthropogenic space debris, which is the, the fragments, the discarded rocket bodies, exploded parts, paint ships, nuts and bolts that are in mostly low Earth orbit. So that's the, the part of the orbit that's like 200 kilometers up through 2000 kilometers roughly. And most of our space junk is there. And because of the, the physics of orbital dynamics, they move at a particular speed in order to stay there. So the collisions between these objects tend to be on the order of 10 kilometers per second, which is about like 15 to 20,000 miles per hour, roughly. Um, meteoroids, on the other hand, so that these are the sort of natural rocky objects that are in space, they, they collide with each other, they fragment. We basically have a very dusty and dirty solar system with 
bits of gravel, rubble, ice all over. And as the earth is plowing through this, these things are dropping into the earth's gravity well from outside, which means they're going much, much faster than debris. They tend to go, once they enter the earth system and fall into earth's gravity well, they can be hitting satellites at 11 to 72 kilometers per second. So that's up to maybe 150,000 miles per hour. So it, the numbers get a lot bigger. And if you've taken high school physics and you know kinetic energy is one half mass times the velocity squared, that square of the velocity, if the particle is going 10 times faster than debris is, so from a seven kilometer per second to a 70 kilometer per second, that's a hundred fold increase in the energy that's coming in. So once, either, whether it's meteoroids or debris, they can have sort of two end of life scenarios around the earth system. One is before really slowing down, they just smash into a satellite. And that's what I did for my PhD was look at what happens when you take a particle that's moving at tens of kilometers per second and it hits a rigid body and just explodes, vaporizes, ionizes. The other way it can end is a gradual ablation in the Earth's atmosphere. So that's when a meteoroid becomes a shooting star or a meteor. So the, the meteoroid we treat as the solid body in space, the meteor is the plasma that's formed as it burns up in the atmosphere. And that plasma is formed not just from the ionized particles of the meteorite itself, but as those particles ablate, they're hitting the atmospheric particles around them and ionizing those things. So you end up with much more plasma formed that's from the ambient atmosphere than from just the particle itself. And, and that's what creates this sort of plasma trail that can also affect RF. And so we study these through a variety of mechanisms. On the impact side, we go to ground-based accelerator facilities. So we go to NASA Ames with their light gas gun that can shoot milligram-sized particles at five kilometers per second. And we put our sensors in there and we shoot stuff at targets and get high-speed video, cool pictures of what comes out. And we also go to facilities like there's one in Germany and there's one in Colorado. These are called electrostatic dust accelerators that can shoot really, really small micron-sized particles at up to 100 kilometers per second. So we can on the ground actually replicate meteoroid impact speeds in a vacuum chamber. Right. So, so we, we do these ground-based experiments. And back to the question uh, that I originally asked, because you, now you've hit on it, is do these plasma trails have a frequency associated with them? Uh, yeah, so what are the, imp the uh, impact on RF transmission of these things? Because that's really the crux of what I think your genius is here at and how we understand, uh, we want to understand and and try and figure that into our technology and our, uh, our research. Okay, so I, I'm gonna break this again into two parts. One is the impact event, which creates a plasma there. The other is the slow ablation of the meteoroid through the atmosphere, which creates a meteor, which is a different type of plasma or, or, or a different nature of plasma. So for the first part, when we have a meteoroid that hits a spacecraft, What's happening is all of that kinetic energy that I talked about is being transformed into melting, vaporizing, ionizing the, the projectile as well as a piece of the spacecraft. So it forms a crater and what comes out of the crater is a very, very dense plasma that starts with a lot of ions and electrons that are so smushed together that they're basically as dense as the solid material itself. Mm. So, so it's a very different physics from when it, once it starts rapidly expanding, it's able to sort of wiggle and wobble and, and do its plasma stuff. But that, that's where plasmas are really interesting because they span such a wide regime of states. When they're very dense, very compact, then you have all of these ions and electrons behaving sort of like a fluid, so like a liquid, right? You've got pressure forces that are pushing things around which can dominate over the electromagnetic forces that come from the fact that there are ions and electrons with charge. And then as you get more rarefied, it starts becoming more like a collisional gas. So it's able to, to equilibrate its temperatures that, that creates different velocity distributions for the species that are lighter versus heavier. And finally, as it really expands, you get the, the more true plasma dynamics where it's, 
the, the outer sheath of it might be composed of electrons. It's still a conductive medium. So like a metal, it can actually act as a Faraday cage and shield external fields from penetrating the inside and it can do, do its own dynamics. And those dynamics are driven by a couple fundamental plasma frequencies. So one, one of these is sort of just an electrostatic oscillation. So if you imagine a plasma being just, let, let's take a step back and just say it's a uniform soup of ions and electrons. Then if you take the, the time scales of those, the ions are so much more massive than the electrons, typically like a thousand times more massive. So on the scale of how fast the electrons are moving, the ions are basically frozen, right? So if you're looking at just electrons wiggling around, the ions are moving so much slower that we can treat them as fixed as a background. So it, in basically the first chapter of uh, any plasma physics course, what we learn about is what happens when you take a, a static ion background and you take electrons and you sort of wiggle them around. And because of the electrostatic attraction between the, the electron and the ions behind it, if you take an electron and you perturb it, it's like taking a mass on a spring, right? You, you pull it off and it's got a natural frequency to oscillate back and forth. And so- And what would that frequency be? Can you give us some range of um, you know, where that frequency lies in the uh, spectrum? So it's going to be based on fundamentally very much driven by the density and the density changes over time. So it starts very dense and it verifies. So because of that, what we believe is that the electromagnetic radiation and the, the fundamental frequency of the plasma over the course of about a microsecond does this sort of frequency sweep from terahertz down to low megahertz or and below? So, so it basically very rapidly sweeps through a very wide frequency range, which is also one of the things that makes it really hard to to measure or diagnose. Right. So it seems like just not to interrupt you, but it seems like um, using a frequency hopping um, strategy might be helpful in trying to avoid that. Um, range of interference that goes from terahertz to megahertz um, and using frequency hopping might be a good scheme to avoid that sort of thing. You agree? I'm not sure I do. And the, the reason for this is that the, the impact phenomenon is one that occurs intermittently, but very rapidly. So it's not like you really have the time to see oh, I've been hit by an impact, I'm going to shift to a lower frequency, and then as it sweeps down, I'm going to hop back that's over true. it. That whole thing is going to happen on a time scale that's so fast that it's more like you have to be robust to intermittent spikes wherever you happen to be. And by the time you see it, there, there's not really any point in hopping because it's moved beyond that. But, uh, but I, you mentioned earlier uh, a Faraday cage, which I'm familiar with a little bit. Um, and that would seem to be a more impactful barrier to frequencies um, and interference in this situation. Mm -hmm. um, and so that might be more of where frequency hopping might benefit. Is, is that correct? Or am I still off offline here a little bit? So in, in terms of Faraday cages, I, I do think spacecraft can and should shield from electromagnetic effects more than they do. So if you look at NASA handbooks, ESA, DOD, they have very specific guidelines on electromagnetic compatibility, which means that they basically have graphs showing over this frequency range, you have to A, be able, anything that flies has to be able to accept interference up to this power level at that frequency and cannot produce interference to other things above a certain power level at as a function of frequency. So I think one of the things we've been really focused on is trying to figure out, do we need to enhance those standards? Do we need to beef up any sort of shielding of internal spacecraft electronics to be able to survive these effects that we're seeing from meteoroids? The problem is if you're talking radios, they fundamentally can't shield because they fundamentally, if you shield everything in a radio, nothing's getting out, right? So, right. So you need that window 
And that window has to be designed around like your link budget, your operating frequency or, or operating frequencies, plural. Right. But there, there has to be a window there and there has to be an antenna and a structure that is susceptible to electromagnetic radiation. One of the things you said on our preliminary call that was I found the most interesting is that, and this is so um, simple, if you will, but that you need to protect your most important gear as the deepest inside your satellite so that you're not, uh, you know, exposing it to the things you've talked about, which were our hits and plasma and those sorts of things. But that's so logical. It makes total sense. But I wonder, is that what, what's being done currently in satellite design? Or is that a gap in the way it's being looked at at this time? I think it's like engineering, any engineering problem, it's a trade-off between different factors. So what, what I'm talking about is the idea that if you know you have electromagnetic interference that's coming from outside the spacecraft, and it's a very localized source of interference, it's a point source that's on the surface of the spacecraft. So it's going to fall off with power very quickly. So if you can get your sensitive electronics to be guaranteed one meter away, let's say, buried in the deepest bowels of your spacecraft, then they're not going to see the power that they would see if it's on the very surface. And so the, the challenge there is, well, what is typically in the middle of the spacecraft? Well, other people want stuff there too. Usually spacecraft are built especially geostationary spacecraft, tend to be built with their fuel tanks in the middle, partly because the fuel tank is itself a nice structural element, but also you want to keep the fuel thermally stable and things like that. So there's other things that want to be buried just as much as the electronics. And the other aspect is most of the electronics are meant to be connected to things that are on the outside. If you have solar panels, you're not going to be able to bury those, right? So because they need to see the sun. If you have cameras, if you have radios, they have to be on the outside. So where do you put the supporting equipment? That typically is right next to the, the part that's sticking out. Right. Well, Nicholas, thank you so much. It's really all the time we have today for this. But you've opened my eyes to so many things here. And and uh, I tip my hat to you for all the research you're doing at Stanford I hope we stay in touch and could talk about this more in the future. But this has been a real eye opener for me and uh, I appreciate it. And we'll pass all this on to our researchers. And uh, again, thank you for being here today. Nicholas Lee from Stanford University, uh, research engineer. And thank you, Nicholas. This is Rich Berliner from Digital Locations saying goodbye. Thanks.